legendary reporter Seymour Hirsch is here with us today to talk about his bombshell report on who blew up Nord Stream. His report uh, pointing f fingers at the U.S. involvement in the destruction of the pipeline. He says the CIA blew it up and lied about it, and he's here with us to expand on his reporting and respond to criticisms. Great to see you, Mr. Hirsch. Thank you so much. Sure. Let's start with my criticism about what you just said. Go, I didn't go say for the it. CIA lied about it. I said the White House, the, pre the president of the United States and the White House is lying about it, but that's okay. Both of them. Let's so, go. So tell us about the, the process of reporting the story. Uh, you have one uh, so, uh, anonymous uh, source, a source whose, whose information is not is known to you, but is not uh, identified in the actual uh, report. Can you tell us anything about Mm, th th that source or maybe a documentation they were able to provide to you that made you confident oh. in what that person was telling you was accurate? Oh, if I did, I'd just be out of business, you know, and uh, I've been doing this for a long time with unnamed sources. It, it all depends on where you, when you do it, when you don't do it. When I was at the New York Times, some of the great stories, uh, many of the, the stories that were very important or at least generated a lot of news. In one case, the congressional hearings, uh, the church hearings into the CIA, I, I had no, no name sources. But that time, you know, that was then and this is now. So now there's a lot of criticism. Uh, and I understand that. Um, um, uh, I, I can't talk about my source other than if, if you read the story carefully, uh, um, uh, as I, I'm sure you did. Um, uh, I, the person that's talking to me, uh, if, you, if you're trying to figure out who he is, he's never, he or she is never in a meeting. They're just describing what they know. And that's not uh, inadvertent. That's, you know, that's just the way you protect people. And uh, because there, a lot of people could know things. Um, it wasn't all CIA. It was a, a joint group that was set up at the direction of Jake Sullivan, the, um, uh, the national security advisor. And in a nutshell, I'll just tell you what happened. Um, it's, it's the fall of 2021. The Russians are already, uh, this, the Putin's, but let's just stick with Putin. Putin is already lining up his troops in, in Belarus, uh, and it's clear that he's probably going to go. And the, there's a meeting convened, uh, Jake convenes a meeting, um, uh, I would assume at the, at, the, at the request of the president, uh, Joe Biden, and he brings in a bunch of high-level people from the community, you know, the NSA, CIA, uh, uh, State Department, Joint Chiefs of Staff, what you will, Treasury Department, they, they supply the money. And they meet in a secure, very secure room in the executive office building. Everybody in Washington knows what that is. It's on the compound right next to the uh, White House itself, where most of the offices are. And the issue is uh, they start in December of 2021. And the question they have, and this is a, 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 work, a word of art, is um, uh, <laughs> this is language that is known inside the community, whether what we want to produce, this group, our actions and recommendations that are reversible or irreversible. If they're reversible, we're talking about sanctions, et cetera. If they're irreversible, you're talking about kinetic stuff. And eventually, it, over the next couple of weeks, it emerged that the issue was, of course, the decision was going to be uh, something uh, kinetic. And it eventually, I'm talking about by January, uh, there was a fix on the pipelines could be it. We could hit the pipelines. The worry was always, as, as most well, most people don't know, Nord Stream 1, there are two pipelines that go supply gas, really a very low price and a huge amount of gas to industrial Germany. The first pipeline began in 2011. It was called Nord Stream 1. And historically, going back to the Kennedy years and certainly in the Bush-Cheney years and certainly in this government, and when Joe Biden was in the was vice president, he chaired a group on this. The worry we always had about Russia, always with its great resources of natural gas, uh, they, they have uh, from way, they just have tons of it, gas and, and, um, and, and oil. And um, uh, the worry was that, that Russia was weaponizing this gas. It was using it to get leverage in West Germany, West, Western Europe and Germany. And that was always something that was a problematical uh, for us. We, didn't, we, we wanted to keep Russia from having energy power. And so, it's, and so the same thing happened in this White House in the meeting, the idea was, what do you do with it? And so one of the options the group came up with, they said, we can blow them. Uh, I don't know how far they were, but this was obviously 
by mid-January of 2022. And by this time, the Russians have as many as 100,000 troops coming. If they're not there then, they're there within a few weeks. They're going. And, and uh, we know it. And uh, to the amazement of the group that was, um, had been assembled, and uh, I, I assure you that the president and others didn't have hands-on feeling about it. You don't do it that way. They're, they're always isolated. Uh, uh, they had began their, uh, they, they said it can be done. And that, to their amazement, Victoria Newland, the Undersecretary of State, in last, last, in, uh, last January, um, again, when Russia hasn't come, she gives, she, at a news conference, she said, I assure you if, if, this, if the Russians come, Nord Stream 2 will not exist. It's a brand new, it was the second pipe. Nord Stream 2 was the second gas pipe that was finished, uh, built, it took 10, eight, 10 years, billions of dollars. It was ready to go by early to late 2021, and the Germans sanctioned it. They cut it down. It was full with gas, but the Germans, they didn't pump because the German government, obviously under pressure from us, um, um, froze it. So it was just sitting there full of gas on, on uh, 750 miles, one pipeline, seven hundred. they both were 750 miles or so, all the way from, uh, from a corner of Russia near St. Uh, uh, Leningrad, St. Petersburg all the way down to the tip of um, a city in, in um, Western, I think, of uh, uh, uh -huh. Germany. I get my map mixed up all the time. Anyway, um, it, was, it just was, uh, for the Germans, it was manna. It, there was so much gas, even on Nord Stream 1, that the German uh, um, uh, German companies that had an interest, uh, there was, Nord Stream was controlled by um, uh, 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 Russian oligarchs, Gazprom. They own 51% of it, which means that a lot of the money was kicked back into the Russian uh, uh, treasury. Of course it was, billions every year. But 49% of the pipeline was owned by four Western companies and they all had stock. And those Western companies, there was enough gas for them to sell it to other uh, mm -hmm. people dealing in, in, in uh, home gas heating, et cetera, uh, downstream they call it. It was that much, it was a, it was a bonanza. And the second pipeline was ready to go, and that would have been um, made the Russian ability in the eyes of the White House, and not only this White House, but other White Houses all along, weaponiz weaponization of the gas. Yeah. So she then, well, for reasons but... unknown, at a news conference said, if Russia goes, uh, if, if, if Russia attacks Nord Stream 2 by one way or another, I don't, that's very close to the exact language, will be, will, will not go. Mr. Hirsch, what, what, you're, what you're describing, I think, is the circumstances that show that the incentives here point really against Russia. And of course, the investigations, the independent investigations that have already taken place have found no um, you know, evidence that Russia was at all involved. And in fact, as you've described, there's plenty, uh, there's a conflict of interest that you've described between Germany and, and Western Europe, who are, could be the beneficiaries of, of Russian, of cheap Russian oil, and the United States, who has these broader um, security concerns in terms of its own proxy war with Russia. So I want to get back to, if we can, this issue of the people who are criticizing you on the basis of the source. And I wondered if you could give us any more insight into what you, not not any obviously uh, facts about who the source is or, or any identifying information, but what made you feel confident about the source's firsthand knowledge uh, and the accuracy of the knowledge that the source presented to you. Obviously, there's a great deal of um, kind of factual detail about how strategically the plan was carried out. But in terms of the source representing, confirming that the source was who they represented, that they were in a position where they would have had firsthand knowledge of the events that they described to you, um, can you tell us anything about what assured you that the source was accurately representing their firsthand knowledge? I've been in this business with sources like this for 50 years. Um, when I first did Beli, uh, there was, you know, overwhelmingly disapproval of what I wrote. And most of the stories I wrote that were controversial has always been attacked on the, on the you know, it's, it's easy to get rid of something on the basis of animidity. And so um, uh, you have to understand um, there's, there's no alternatives. Either people, the people I've known inside um, have one thing in common, uh, and, and mil whether military or civilian, and that is they really understand that they've taken their oath of office to, not to not to the their boss, not to the general or admiral, uh, and not to not to the president, but to the constitution. And those are people that, when they get troubled by things that are going on, have talked to me, and it's, it's been going on. I've done this for 50 years, 
So on the and uh, I'm not interested in committing suicide, and I certainly knew the uh, uh, I, I can't I, you're getting me I don't even want to talk about what I know. I wrote the story, and I'll you know I'll give you a hypothetical if you want. I'll give you a question to ask. Sure. You know, next time somebody at the White House briefing who doesn't want to be doesn't want to be called again uh, called on again for the next two months, why don't they ask the president? Hey or the White House, or the White House, whatever, the press spokesman, whoever it is there, why don't they ask him, say, you know what, this happened in September the 26th, last year, and um, uh, uh, nobody knew what did happen, but four days later, uh, Jake Sullivan gave a, pre a, a briefing, and he was asked about it, and he said, well, he, he read, you know, the, the, somebody asked if they thought Russia did it, and he said the usual things, nobody likes Russia in that White House, and, and certainly in that CIA, as far as I can tell, from the spokesman. And um, what he said is, well, there's two countries are looking at it, uh, Sweden and Norway, and we'll see what happens with their investigation. Uh, it's not Sweden and Norway, Sweden and Denmark. The Norwegians who were very involved with us haven't said, have said nothing. And so a month later, sure enough, the, the, Swedes, the Swedes and the Danes issued a report saying that after they studied it, they concluded that indeed something had happened under the water. There had been an explosion. That was the extent of their investigation. So what the White House has, what the president has, if he really wants to know, he's got something called the Office of National Intelligence, which is the highest level office, uh, on, oversees all of the intelligence in the United States government. And they have an office of, uh, the, the ONI, they have an incredibly good, competent uh, head of, uh, of intelligence there. He could have, what the phrase they use inside is task those people to do a study. If he chose also to really dig, he could have asked the CIA, which has a director of intelligence that does terrific work, I will tell you, very solid stuff. He could have asked the CIA to do a study. And there's also a secret, another third intelligence group that nobody talks much about. When we have a COVID operation, an, an agent that's an, an operation like this that's undercover, they have their own intelligence. And we're talking about really old source. If you have people overseas doing stuff uh, that are tricky, you want to really protect them. And so why don't you ask if they ever ask the community for a study? Because I'll tell you what the answer is. They never did. And so why don't you think they did? Well, and, and, and Mr. Hirsch, uh, how would you respond to, uh, there's been some reporting I've seen that the ships you said that, that were used, the Norwegian ships, there's some conflicting GPS data showing, is, is suggesting that they were not actually in the, the area. How would you respond to that part of the criticism? It's called, um, um, it's OSINC, you know, it's uh, uh, open, open source intelligence, which is a big part of the community. Uh, they started that 40 years ago. In other words, they would put out a report, that the CIA, this is after World War II when they were first going and discovered that a lot of what they reported was in, in the open sources. And so if you're, in a, if you're doing a covert operation, and you're talking about people that uh, open source relies on signals. It doesn't have photographs of the ships there. They rely on signals. And they also rely on airplanes that um, every airplane has a transponder, and um, which is sort of an IDF. It gives us, it lets everybody know where they are at all times. Well, if you watched, if you read the paper carefully, when the president went to um, Kiev, uh, when his plane was flying, I think, in the Pol from into Poland, Guess what they did? It was in the newspaper. They turned off their transponder. And so I will tell you the trouble with open source intelligence. I've said this to a few people, including one of the guys writing it. But, you know, when, when, you're, when you're really into computer and computer analysis, um, uh, the first thing you do in an operation like that is you use open source as a cover. Helps you. You invent boats that aren't there. You have airplanes that turned off transponder, which means you can't be seen. It's really as simple as that. Hmm. They're, they're, I'm being also attacked. They're claiming that the boat, somebody claimed that the boat, uh, the class of the boat wasn't there. <laughs> but we can, <laughs> the guys who know what they're doing, they can turn everything topsy-turvy. They can create boats, signals of boats. So it's that's what you do before a mission like that. That's the answer to it. It's really very simple. If those people had asked anybody in the community, they would have told you the first thing you do is manipulate the, the, the ongoing intelligence. In fact, what they had up there was the same plane that the president had when he was in Kiev. It's called a, a river joint. It's a, a basically a national security agency, a, a Air Force wing. It's an old 707 that flies on the border of Russia uh, collecting radar signals. They had 
the president had what is in the paper they had uh, a river joint uh surveillance plane from the uh, as i said um, there in case he has to get a signal out of emergency and it's, it's there's a direct line they had that up and during this mission in case the guys the the divers or the crew of the ship or something happened they could communicate uh it's it's so it's it's um uh, you know, I don't want to break the hearts of OSINT people because a lot of it is very useful, particularly in mostly in, in uh, tracking airplane crashes and stuff like that. Um, but when it comes to COVID intelligence operators, they're actually part of the cover. Hmm. Well, National Security Council uh, spokesperson John Kirby, as I'm sure you're aware, has repeatedly uh, denied the United States was involved in the explosions that damaged these pipelines. He told Fox News Sunday, quote, it's a completely false story. There is no truth to it, not a shred of it. It is not true. The United States and no proxies of the United States had anything to do with that. Uh, can you comment directly uh, on that statement? Your, your, your friend, he describes himself as your friend, Ray McGovern, recently uh, gave uh, remarks at the U.N. Security Council and basically said uh, these kind of CAA PR statements aren't to be trusted. What's your response? Well, you, you have to identify Ray a little better. Uh, he was in the CIA for many years, and he was probably the key guy when we were doing a lot of talks about with the Russians on, um, on, on treaties. He spent 27 years in the CIA as an intelligence officer and got to be a level that he was sort of the go-to guy when, when we were negotiating uh, various uh, ABM treaties with the Soviet Union. So he does, he does know a little more than that. John Kirby's a nice guy. I used to work, John was uh, in the Pentagon. Uh, when I was at the New Yorker after 9-11, after I wrote a lot of stories that were heatedly denied uh, by the White House when I was at, working for the New Yorker. This was in the days of Cheney and Bush. And I always liked John. He's a very good guy. And um, I, I did talk to him about this story long before I wrote it, let him know what I was doing. And he told, you know, uh, I was off the record, so it doesn't matter. But um, he didn't say anything, anything other than, than, uh, than, than what he said publicly, but there was other stuff he talked about. And uh, um, uh, he'll be the first, if you ask him, um, if there were an operation like this, would the spokesman for the joint JC, I mean, the spokesman wouldn't know. Why would you tell him? Mm -hmm. Why would you tell a spokesman anything? Why would even internally would you talk about it? This is, I mean. So you think he genuinely <laughs> does not know that the, the, he's he, he's not lying there? He doesn't know. No, no, he's not a liar. He's not. He's asked and he's told no, nothing happened. I mean, I, sh I don't know if he's asked or not. I'm sure he has. But why why would he be told? Why would right. uh, I think I said very early, the way they run this operation, the people in the field in Norway or wherever they are in the United States. Are, are isolated. Uh, you, the last thing you want to do with something like this is, you know, you, is uh, uh, telling the principals, uh, uh, can I give you a reason why? In January, they told the principals that they could do something. And within uh, three weeks, both uh, Victoria Newland blabbed about it and said, we'll get it one way or the other. And the president himself said at a briefing on February the 7th, we can take it out, and if they go, we will take it out. I don't know why the press forgets that language, but it horrified the people who were just beginning to get organized on it because it, it just was, to them, it was, it's the most secret thing in the world. And the, the, the Undersecretary of State and the President of the United States, are, the word used to me was blabbing about it. Mm. You, know, you mentioned just a, a minute ago that you know you you have this long history of writing for outlets like uh, the New Yorker. It, did you approach any of the kind of you know mainstream type organizations or, or media outlets you've worked with in the past with this story and try to get it published there? Did they reject it, you, or, or were you just going to do this on your own for Substack? Can you tell us anything about the editorial process? Sure. Um, um, I don't think I could have got the Milai story published now. Things have changed a lot because of Trump. As you know, I'm not, I'm not telling anybody that knows there's Fox News and the New York Post and other papers like that. And then there's the Washington Post and the New York Times. Uh, actually, the, neither one of those papers mentioned my story. It's been out for a couple of weeks. But I'm, I, I'm telling you, I'm getting massacred by calls from overseas on it. I mean, I, I really am. Um, uh, 350, 400 emails today, half of them from overseas news outlets. It's different there. I think the Washington Post, I'm told, I haven't seen it, had a story today for the first time mentioned what I did in the country. There was a, a, a Security Council meeting about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, the New York Times hasn't mentioned it yet. I, I, I just, I, I see what's going on, the polarization of the press that didn't exist. I joined the Times in 72 because, um, and I, I could, 
I, I got, there was no question about what I could do. It's the, the halcyon days, it's different now. And no, I never thought of approaching either paper because I didn't think they would publish it, I mean, particularly because they want to know the source. And um, uh, uh, I always told the editors the source. And um, uh, I got burned once uh, at the New York Times that way. I don't, want, I don't like talking about it because the New York Times is still a good newspaper, a lot of fine reporters. I've always been convinced that 90% of the editors, if they were fired, we'd have a much better news organization. <laughs> I, I saw who got promoted as we went along. But um, no, Substack is, is um, I have a, I'm a friend of Matt Taibbi, who's um, got a head of Substack uh, uh, calm going. And he was telling me it's much more vibrant and it's much more interesting because uh, I self-publish. I use uh, superb editors. Um, I'm using one of my editors was that I worked for the London Review of Books and a very bright guy named Chris Lorenzen uh, is the editor and he's great. I listen to him and I use as far as possible. Sometimes I can't always get him. I use fact checkers that used to work at the New Yorker when I was there. And at that time, there was no worry about sources. Uh, they knew all my sources. That's really um, interesting. That's, that's interesting to know because some people have criticized you on the basis that because you're independent, you haven't had that editorial process. You weren't able to say share the source with an editor and have them, you know, double check and confirm and 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 give their own gut check on things. But you're saying that that actually isn't the case. That you're still using the same the same kind of team that you had at these institutional papers, but they're no longer affiliated, even though you're at no, Substack. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the biggest difference in a way that uh, that may be the doom for, for good reporting on newspapers. When I was at the New Yorker, for example, I had a big run. At, um, I did the Abu Ghraib story and I, for three three weeks in a row, I was, and the paper was, the magazine would tell me you're doing, it's, they were all happy because Newsstand sales were going up. Newsstand sales of magazines are just about zip now. But they, uh, newsstand sales are going up. Circulation is growing. And at the end of the year, um, uh, since I was working for a company, um, uh, 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 I, I, I was always a freelancer. I never wanted to be on the staff of the New Yorker just because I didn't like it. But I was, you know, I was making, you know, earning a lot of money. But at the end of the year, I got a case of wine. And I guess the people that run the magazine, because of this, the increase in circulation my stories generated, uh, they might have got a hell of a big bonus. Subsack says, <laughs> I'm self-publishing. I, di I didn't do it for money. It's not about money. But it is interesting to me that in the long run, um, uh, this kind of a system, the Subsack was started in part by um, a couple of guys from... Um, New Zealand. One was a, a high-tech uh, writer, a, a journalist on high-tech, and the other one, was, I guess, was an entrepreneur. I don't know when they started five, six years ago, but I will tell you, it is the most amazing place. The story I put up from nowhere had over a million uh, hits within you know, 20 hours, and I get letters constantly from people saying, what happened to this kind of reporting? There's not much of it. Right now, I, I assure you, um, um, I knew this when I worked at the New York Times. I knew that I was one of the very rare people who actually had people on the inside who were not afraid to talk about things they didn't like. Uh, you know so what I'm saying? If there's something going wrong. And that's something you, it, yeah. I, I've had three or four like that in 50 years. Yeah. And that's and before we let is. you go, can you tell us anything about you are what's coming next? Go. I'm so happy. To hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've kept not, we've kept not, you here a long time, and we really appreciate it. Can you preview so, for us so you know, what, your additional minutes. reporting on this subject? What'd you say? Uh, what's coming next? What are you working on now? Well, I did a couple more pieces. I just did a piece uh, say Thursday yesterday. Um, uh, I think lying about the pipeline in the long run. Um, uh, it, 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 I don't, this White House can never acknowledge it, but uh, let's assume. It's a big leap for you, maybe, and for a lot of people, maybe. Uh, let's assume I'm right. Uh, what Joe Biden did in the fall, at that time, as I understand it, uh, from inside the community, what I know from my friends inside about the, how the war is going is almost like it's day and night between what you're reading in the newspapers. It's not going well at all. And that there's no way they're going to, no end in sight of a victory. They may, if they can get a stalemate, Maybe, but I don't think that's possible. The Russians have yet to put any of their main forces in. I mean, that's a huge clop. Whether you like Putin or don't like Putin, and most people here really hate Putin. And I have to say, anybody that starts a war, even with some justification, we did encroach NATO on him. 
and we're promising not to. But anybody who starts a war has to pay. You know, he's got to he's 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 got to own up to that. And you know, at some point, you know, in whether in life or death, uh, you don't start wars. The most bloody most bloody war in the, in uh, Europe since uh, World War II. Um, you just that's not casual. Something casually to do. So, but having said having said that. Um, uh, uh, oh, let, let it go at that. I mean, I, 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 I'm not doing this because I, I, I have any, re, you know, I have any reason to have any special feelings for Russia, but I don't think the war is going to, I think this fall is going to be very rough. It's going to make a lot of the reporting that we're seeing not a, a little, you know, a little over enthusiastic about it. Here's the problem by killing the pipeline. And there was a pipeline, the second pipeline, the first one, for, Putin had already shut down the first line, pipeline. By killing the second one, he, which is controlled, was sanctioned by Germany. The worry he had in late fall, because I think very much he was aware this, this was going to be a slog, S-L-O-G, at the very best and very bloody, which we're seeing right now. And the casualties are, they're, they're brutal on both sides, but Ukraine can hardly afford them. Russia can. Big difference. And um, what he did is he said to Germany, now, if you decide to change your mind, Germany, you know, Germany, because of its role in World War II, is always very reluctant to go military. And there was a lot of pressure on Scholl, the, the chancellor, to not support uh, us in the Ukraine. And there was a lot of feeling in NATO that this war wasn't going the well, as well as it should. And, um, and I will tell you right now, um, uh, price of, of electricity, which is uh, the... the, the uh, five times higher now in France, or in France, three or four times for gas in, in Italy. Uh, it's already doubling. It's getting higher already in Germany. It's going to be. It's they'll get through. Spring's coming, but next fall is going to be a disaster, and they all know it. And it's hurting the economy even now. The big companies don't have enough gas. They have the largest gas company, a chemical company in the world, BASF, is in Germany. They've been talking to the Chinese about maybe moving some facilities there because they they don't have enough gas, and they, what they do get, they're paying too much for. Profits go down. Anyway, the upshot is that that uh, by by cutting off their pipeline, blowing it up, he's denied the German government a chance to open up the pipeline and keep their people warm. And uh, prices, and not paying, and paying minimal prices for for heating, not only the rest of la last winter, but next winter, and that's not going to stand him well. I'm getting a lot of messages from Europe. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't talk to politicians ever. I never liked, I never testified before the Congress. Not that, by the way, I don't see the Democrats in the Senate wanting a. The investigation of this. <laughs> Most certainly they? not. In fact, we covered on my radar today uh, in another segment the fact that uh, Hakeem Jeffries, ha House Minority Leader, was confronted by an activist about whether or not he'd call for some kind of investigation, and he got kind of a non-answer. So I think you're right on the money on that one, and we really are so appreciative of all of the time you've been willing to spend with us here today, and we hope you come back uh, to Rising sometime soon and give us an update. This is the longest eight-minute interview I've had this week. <laughs> <laughs> You're okay, too good guys. to be contained to eight anyway. minutes. Thank you again, Seymour Hirsch. And, uh, and we'll listen, um, uh, I, I, I welcome those questions because, you know, it's just too easy to dismiss things on the source basis. It's much more complicated than that. And as you may or may not know. But anyway, thank you for bringing up the issue. Thank bye you bye, again. Guys. Take care. Thank you. We'll have more rising for you after this.